morning, you guys. Everybody good? Happy holiday weekend to you. Um, we are in week four of this series we called Experiencing God, Knowing and Doing the Will of God. Um, and so far, so far in this series, we are, we've looked at two realities, all right, of experiencing God, right? We all want to experience God. We want to know God, hopefully. We want to do what God wants us to do. Or rather, the, the bigger thing is we want to know what God's will and plan is for our lives. That's the universal question. God, what do you want for my life? Why am I here, right? What's my purpose? So the first reality we've looked at so far in this series is that God is at work all around us. That God is at work, right? Number two, the, the second reality is God pursues a love relationship with us. And so that this is like kind of Christianity 101. It's like basic Christianity, but Hopefully, what, what I've always heard is that some of the most profound things that, we, that I could hear are just reminders of things that I already know, correct? Amen? Like sometimes, it's not the new thing, it's the thing that I've known all my life or close to all my life that I'm reminded of that, that I hear with a different set of ears, so to speak, or I hear differently the, 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 the hundredth time that I didn't hear the 99th time, correct? So... We know this, God is at work all around us. Um, whether we re- recognize it, realize it or not, God is at work. Number two, God pursues a love relationship with us through Jesus Christ's death and resurrection on the cross. And so this morning, we're gonna look at the third reality in the series. We're gonna kind of move over into um, kind of the, the, um, the next step of the love relationship that God is initiated, God initiated, and not us, but that God initiates with us, and that is God's invitation. God has invited humanity to join him in his redemptive work in the world. God invites you and me somehow to be a part of what he is doing. Now, I want that to settle in on you because if you grew up in church, <clears throat> that statement doesn't really hit that hard anymore because you've heard it so much. That God not only desires a relationship, intimacy with us, but he invites us into the work that He is doing, the work that he desires to do. He invites you into that. In the Gospels, Jesus began his earthly ministry by tapping a few young men on the shoulder, an invitation to follow him. And the promise would be that if they follow him, he will make them what? Fishers of men, right? That was an invitation followed by a promise that if if we follow, if we accept the invitation, then here's what Jesus is going to do. But there's another invitation way back in the Old Testament that we're going to look at this morning. I I I want us to take a look at together. To me, it's one of the most amazing invitations in all the Bible. It's also one of the most powerful encounters between God and humans ever recorded, right? And that's an important thing to note as we move forward because this series is all about encountering God. It's not just knowing a lot of stuff about God. It's not, it's not about downloading information about God. Right, some robotic thing that's uh, it's it's not just academic, right? This is an encounter. This is supposed to be about encounters with the living God that will change and transform us. That's what this series is really about, right? No matter if you've been a Christian for thirty years, or if you are a brand new Christian, or if you're just kind of sticking your toe in the water of the Christian faith and you're not sure yet, you're kind of a what I would call a pre-Christian. You're curious. And you're here, but you really don't know where you stand in your faith. All of this, this is for all of us this morning. God invites us to the work that he is doing. He invites us in on that, to be partners with God. I mean, that, the thing about to be part, a partner with God in anything is just mind-blowing, right? It's mind-blowing. Because we, there's a, we're going to get to this in a second, but there's an inadequacy that kind of runs through my, my thoughts when I think about God wanting me to partner with him in anything. 
right? I, I, there's, there's nothing in me that, that, is, that feels like I, I deserve that. So the, the God encounter I want us to look at is, in, is found in Exodus chapter 3. And I want you to turn there with me. Exodus chapter 3, the first 12 verses. This will be familiar to, if you grew up in church, you've been to a VBS, <laughs> uh, been in Sunday school, you will have heard this read and taught on and we know it well. But this is one of the most awesome God encounters in all the Bible. Verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was the bush, <laughs> sorry, was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Of course it is. Why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him within the bush, from within the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And here's Moses' reply. Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them cry out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt." God is inviting and calling Moses into into the work that he's about to do. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign that, that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, when it, not if it happens, but when it happens, When it happens, you will worship God on this mountain. You'll be back here at some point knowing what I have done, and you'll thank me for it. See, God chose Moses for a specific task that God God had a plan. Moses hesitated because why wouldn't he? All those insecurities that we all have as, as people. Who am I? Who am I that you would use me? What? I don't know if you've ever asked yourself that. I don't know if you've ever thought that to yourself. As a a Christian, as a believer, who am I that God would choose me? By the way, that is a very healthy way to look at yourself. That is not a self-deprecating, the world would call it low self-esteem. I think for a believer, when we understand how big God is and how small we are in comparison How could you not say, who am I? How could we not say, who am I? That should be a natural response through the Holy Spirit to say, how in the world God could choose me to do anything of significance? We're getting somewhere if if, if that's our attitude. We're getting somewhere. What you don't want, what we don't want is to have the attitude, well, why wouldn't God choose me? I've got all this, I've got this talent and ability and I'm, I'm, I'm well connected and, I, and, and people respect me in, this, in, in my, in my um, social circle and, and I'm real well respected in, in this town and I, you know, I've got a voice and so why, why wouldn't God choose me? That's a, that, that, that to me, that is, and we're gonna look at that, that, those two extremes and how God can use a person based on the attitude of how they see themselves. This is exactly what God wanted. God wanted Moses to say, who am I? God wanted him to say, what, not me. God wanted him to say, well, I have a speech impediment, right? I, can't, I don't speak very good. That's what he said. I don't, I don't speak well. I'm not a public speaker. 
By the way, God doesn't just use the, the, the public speakers, the preachers, the pastors to do the work of, of God. It, it is you, the church. I'm a part of that too. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just a, a, one of the shepherds that, that, that are, are, my calling is to help fan the flame, to push you out, to push myself out, to do the work of God. It's not me who does it, it alone or Shannon or whoever is standing in a pulpit or in a position of authority. We all have the call on our lives to be a part of what God is doing. See, like Moses, we feel very inadequate. We feel inadequate. And this is what God wants. As Paul said so famously in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, his power works best in our what? Weakness. His strength operates best from human, through human weakness. Who am I is a great question to ask as we think about God using us this morning. Who am I? And I want to say this, we are not insignificant, but we are insufficient. We are not insignificant. God, we, are lo- we just sang, I'm his beloved. We are loved by God. And the love, the love relationship that occurs at salvation, when we accept Christ's gift of forgiveness and grace for us, initiates, is initiated by God. And, 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 that, and then the result of that is then a, 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 an invitation that comes along with that. Not to just be saved or be a Christian, but to, to allow and to, and to be used so that others can come to know him as well. You and I are not insignificant, but we are insufficient or inadequate. We are. We are inadequate to do the work that God calls us to do on our own. We are. We just are. No matter how talented and brilliant you are. Well, I, I, I obviously, I, I disciple young people and, uh, um, for almost 25 years. And one of the things that, that, that I warn um, young people about, and it's a warning for us too as adults, is, as they step from high school over into college, is that the danger in being a really, really intelligent person is that the enemy whispers in your ear and tell you just how intelligent you are. And then we become our own God, so to speak, as in we don't need God because we figured it out and we, we, can, we, can, we can manage life on our own. We're, we're talented, we're, we're brilliant, we can go get a great job and make a lot of money and we can, we can live like that and we don't really need God. Intellect, ability, talent, Social standing are all obstacles to how God wants to use us. God wants to use those things, but God will not allow them to be gods or idols in your life. God wants to use your position in this town to bring him glory, not to, not to bring yourself glory. Right? Feelings of insufficiency or inadequacy when it comes to God and us and the relationship there is perfectly normal and healthy. It's healthy to, un, to say, who am I? In fact, that's how God wants it. See, we've been given divine significance by God who loves us. He wants us to know him, and he wants to help others know him as well. But we are not capable of doing anything good on our own, right? Apart from him, you, we can do what? Nothing, as Scripture would say. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, God reassured Moses. He didn't say, notice God didn't say, oh, Moses, like, you can do it, man. You can do it. I believe in you. You can do it. Now, there's a a little bit of that motivation. Yes, like pull yourself up by the bootstraps, all that stuff. Yeah, just don't, don't let your fears and anxieties paralyze you. But God didn't say, you can do it. You're fully capable on on your own of going to Pharaoh and releasing the people of Israel. He didn't say that. What did he say? I will be what? With you. The focus is on God here. The focus is on God. Because whatever good thing happens in my life, God does it. God does it. My response, our, our, our role in this is to submit and allow God to do it. 
The question here is, do you think God needed Moses to do what God had planned? You think God needed Moses? Absolutely not. God didn't need Moses. Moses is a great man. Moses is a hero of the faith. But God absolutely did not need Moses. God doesn't need us to accomplish his work. You might say, well, why does he call us to do it? Because he wants us. He doesn't need us, but he wants us. That's part of the love relationship that God calls us into. In fact, humans are God's chosen method for doing his work here on earth. And as we said before, the story of Scripture is not about us. It is about God. It is his story, not our story with God woven into it. It's not our story with a shout out to God or God perched on our shoulder or God is Jesus is my co-pilot. That's terrible theology, terrible. It's not at all in close to being accurate. It is about God and God alone and who am I that I should even be loved and noticed by God, right? That, this is the attitude of revival, the attitude of revival is saying, who am I? I can't believe God would want to use me, but I'm so happy that God would want to use me. I'm, I'm elated. So God, how do you want to use me? He doesn't need us, but he wants us to do what he's called us to do. So God alone initiates the relationship. God alone does everything through us. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his purpose. His purpose, not ours. But why? Why does God choose to use sinful, broken, messed up people? If you look at, what, I had a conversation with a, a coaching friend of mine this week. And he, he said, you know, I'm going through 1 Samuel and, and this is really interesting about Samuel um, and, and Samuel's mother and how she was barren. She couldn't have children, and she prayed and prayed and prayed, and God gave her Samuel. And, and in return, he, she consecrated him to God, left him at the, at the temple with, with Eli, the priest, to, be, to raise him because she was so grateful that God answered her prayer. And he said, um, he said, it's interesting to me how God, all these people that I read about weren't uh, on another level when it comes to um, uh, holiness and the way that they were just normal people. They were just normal people that are canonized as examples of what God can do through a broken person, right? And if you look at Jesus' bloodline, man, there are all kinds of messed up people in that bloodline, beginning with King David. Man. We want to talk about how great David was, but let's talk about how messed up he was as well. How many mistakes he made? How many failures? David did things that most of us in here will never be guilty of doing. And yet, he was a man after God's own heart. Jesus is in that bloodline. There are a lot of characters in Jesus' bloodline. That is the proof that God wants to. He doesn't want to use people that have it together. He wants to use broken people. He wants to use people that understand their brokenness. That's, that's the main thing. When I understand how broken and feeble and frail I am, and I, really I can bring nothing good to the table, God will use that. Do you know why he wants to use sinful, broken people to accomplish his purpose? Because he wants to get the credit. He wants to get the credit. He wants to get the glory. He don't want you or I taking any glory from him. Why? Because we take glory for ourselves. God, people will never see God through us and in us. If we get the glory, people will never see Jesus in us. If we get the glory, if we get the credit, then that's not the gospel being portrayed in our lives. It's just, look how good I am. This is why God's desire is to use flawed, broken people to accomplish his work. That when, when we, see, we see the world like God sees it, and we do what God wants to do, we go where God wants to do, we say, wow, this must be God because there's no way a human could, could accomplish this. Like Gideon. Now Gideon had this massive army with, with thousands and thousands of soldiers. And God kept sending them home. Sending them home one by one. He whittled that thing down to 300 men against thousands. And they won. They, they didn't have to draw a sword. That other army turned on themselves. And God received the credit because it was so crazy and outlandish that, that, that only God could have done it. 
This is the work that God wants to do. The invitation is for you to surrender, for me to surrender, and to allow God and to wo- sit back and let God work, right? Now, we have a part to play in this. We're not just sitting back in the, on the lawn chair and saying, God, you go do it. So what is the work? What is the work? The work is the redemption of the universe. The, the work is the redeeming of mankind. Actually, it's the redeeming of all creation. The work is for God to do something. Just, just one step towards redeeming and saving the world. God can use you to do that. So how do I become a part of this work? By surrendering my plans in favor of God's plans. Let's take all the plans, all that, all that, that, that five-year, 10-year, 20-year plan, Take all of those things that you assume was going to happen in the future. We assume a lot, don't we? We assume we know where we're going to be in, in, in a year, five, ten years. We assume we're going to be here on earth. We assume too much. Take all those assumptions, all those plans, and lay it on an altar before God. Say, these are yours now. They, know, they don't belong to me. They're yours. We tell high school seniors every year we have, we have this talk. Look, look here. I know mom and daddy want you to go to so and so. And I'm not we're not we're not we're not going against mom and daddy, but have you asked God what he wants for you? Mom and dad, are you okay with us saying that? I hope you are. We're gonna say it anyway, but no apologies here. And parents, we want to encourage you to talk to God about it too. Right? The question is that so many ask is, what is God's will for my life? How does a person know the will of God for their life? Here's how you know it. By knowing God himself, by getting to know God, by spending time in God's presence. This is how we get to know the will of God. My youth pastor used to say, the way to know God's will for tomorrow is to be obedient today. The way to know God's will for tomorrow is to be obedient to him today. That's it. I'll, ne- I'll take that to my grave. I'll never, I didn't hear a lot of what he said. Those are one of those things I'll never, ever forget. The other thing is you'll never rise above how much you pray. Your prayer life is who you are as a Christian, period. So here's the work. Here's the work God's called us to. To know God and to make him known. To know God and to make God known. To love God and to love others. The first and greatest commandment. To love God and love others. This happens through obedience to God. Doing what God wants. Did you know there's a memory verse? Uh, there are memory verses in, in this, in this uh, experience in God's study. You know, I, 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 gosh, I get on this all the time. But I think one of the saddest things that we have lost in the modern church is memorizing scripture. Initiative to memorize scripture. When, when, when God says to hide his word in your heart, how do you think it gets there? How do you think it gets there? Do you think by me speaking it and us reading it together that you download it? It just, it just sticks and stays? Maybe. But you got to read it over and over. It has to find its way, work its way into the fabric of your heart. And what happens when you don't have a Bible handy, I know you've got the Bible app now, but way back in the day, before we had the Bible app, it was only paper Bibles. It's the only way you could recall Scripture is to memorize Scripture. I want, I want, this is a memory verse this morning. I want to read this to you. This is John 14, 21. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. I know that's wordy. But I challenge you to make that a memory verse that you can found your life on. Point number one this morning, God's invitation is for everyone. God's invitation is for all of us, everyone. It's God's deep desire that everyone comes to know him in a love relationship through Jesus Christ. So if you don't know him this morning, God is actively pursuing you. He's actively pursuing you. He wants you to know him. He knows you, he wants you to know him. And if you, do, if you don't know him already, his desire is to work in you and to use 
you to draw others to him as well. God's invitation has been extended to all of us in very unique ways. Very unique ways. My, my call may not be your call. My, my invitation to go and do might not, be, might not look quite like yours. But there's a, there's a general blanket invitation for every single one of us, and that is to know God and make him known. But then it gets down to some specific things. Point number two, God's invitation will bring the unexpected. It will get ready. As we say in, in, uh, in, in, the, in the athletics world, in the sports world, a uh, coach will blow a whistle and say, sudden change. Sudden change, right? Sudden change. Here's what the schedule says, the practice schedule says, but here we're gonna about, to go, about to go do this. In my head, coach does sudden change. Coach goes, Ben, man, there's sudden change every, all the time. You're like, head on a swivel because there could be sudden change. That, that's to get people ready for the unexpected. You see, he doesn't have to invite us into anything, but by his good pleasure, he's woven humanity into the fabric of his, his work in the world. We should be grateful for that. We should have a heart of gratitude for that. But it brings an unexpected thing with it, by, like my, ch- my plans changing. My plans changing. And point number three, God's invitation is time sensitive. It is time sensitive. You don't have forever. You're not promised tomorrow. Now is the time. Now is the time to say yes to an invitation. Whatever God is calling you to, you have to work that out with God. That's what God is calling you to. Don't get to the end of your life and have regret that you didn't surrender your life to the will and way of God. Don't get to the end of your life. or don't uh, uh, Teenagers, don't get in, in, into your 40s and have regret that as a teenager or as a college student, you didn't surrender your life fully and totally to God. Don't wear those scars. Those are unnecessary. They're unnecessary. An adult, if you wear those scars, today is a day of renewal for you. Today can be a day where you say yes to God's invitation. God can and will use you. God can and will use you to do amazing things. I'm gonna tell you this. If you don't answer God's call, then I believe God will choose someone else. If you don't answer God's call, God will choose someone else. I told you before, he doesn't need us. He wants us. If we don't answer God's call, whatever he got, God is calling you to, then he'll choose someone else. How tragic would that be? But there's still time right now to accept God's invitation. In the winter of 1993, I accepted God's invitation of love and forgiveness. And I got saved in my bedroom at the age of 16. I was just reading my Bible. I'd gotten home from practice. And um, I don't know why, but I was just a little bit depressed. And all the things that I'd put so much time and effort into, sports and and, and, and social standing and all this stuff was just, I was just empty. I was just empty. And then in there, I accepted the first invitation that God had been pursuing me my whole life. And then one year later at 17, I accepted another invitation. This was a call to ministry. The summer after I graduated high school, I accepted yet another invitation to become a summer youth director at my home church in Osceola, Georgia. At 17, I had people in my youth group that were older than me, and I had no idea what I was doing. I just knew that I loved Jesus. Man, I I sure hope those kids learned something in that summer. I have no idea. I hope they did. But But somehow I accepted that invitation. Then a few years later, I arrived in Valdosta, the fall of 1998, and I didn't want to be here, y'all. I didn't like this town. I thought God was, I was like, why am I here? This is a mistake. And I thought I would be here maybe a semester, a year, and I would move on to Athens or Atlanta or somewhere else. But God's plan for me was different from the one I had for myself. And what I thought was a detour through Valdosta 
turned out to be a much greater plan for my life than I could have ever dreamed. That detour became a 25-plus year journey that has resulted in me getting plugged into the, day, the first day I stepped on campus, and I was asking God why I was here. I ran into an old friend of mine that got me plugged into a campus ministry, and it changed the direction of my life. And we saw revival happen on our campus. The campus ministry I was a part of went from about 80 people to 400 plus every single Tuesday night on VSU campus. Never seen anything like it. And there are 35 plus people that were in that college ministry, that campus ministry with me, that are now all serving in full-time ministry. I'm one of those. And I'm very, very grateful for God taking my plans and rearranging them. And through it, I met my wife. A call to full-time ministry came down the road in 2011 when I had breakfast with Dr. Bob Moon, and he asked me if I would ever consider getting back into, into student ministry. Here I stand as a product of someone, not a great, a great someone, but someone who, well, at the very least, was willing to see what God wanted to do in my life instead of me pursuing my own deal. Not because I had anything I've done. No, it's because God has been so gracious to invite me, of all people, to join him to be his representative in the world that I live in. Sometimes I want to say, but who am I? I mean, every day I, I say that in some way or another. Who am I that you would use me? that you would graciously extend the offer to work through me so that people can know you. And here's the thing. Had I said no to that seemingly small invitation to enroll at Valdosta State University, then the dominoes of my life would have fallen in a very, very different way. Definitely wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be married to who I'm married to. My kids wouldn't exist. Ministry was, would probably not have been a thing that I would have gone into. And somehow God worked into me, in me to the point where even the slightest bit of obedience in my heart was enough for God to use. And I, and I say that to ask about, you know, to ask the question, what about you? What is God calling you to? Is, is God calling you to something um, you know is like hanging out there? that you haven't said yes to yet. Maybe you're not, maybe God's not calling you to move, switch locations. Maybe God is just calling you to move physically and spiritually in the places he's called you to now. Maybe God is calling you to that workplace, that, that job that you have right now that you think is, is mundane. Maybe God is calling you to, to be a light in those places so that people can know God and, and, as well, Right? Maybe God wants to use you to spark revival in the place that you are. You know what? My journey's not over. Just because I'm here now doesn't mean I should, I should stop being sensitive to what God might have for me. I'm not promised that I'm going to be in Valdosta forever. I'm not promised I'm going to be here next year, five years from now. I'm not promised that. I want to be. I want to be. But I hold that, that want and that desire loosely because God will, will change it. I have no idea what's in store for me. I just want to be obedient to him and say, who am I? At the end of the day, though, he's going to do it. And I say, yes. See, Moses said yes. Moses didn't. Moses had all the excuses in the world. But eventually, Moses surrendered. Moses relinquished control of his own life. So what will we do with the invitation this morning? How will we respond? Will we respond with doubts and rebuttals like Moses? Or we simply, will we simply ignore the invitation? The reality is we can't accept a divine invitation to join God in his work unless we've first accepted God's offer of salvation through Jesus Christ. This is the initiation. God can do a lot through broken people, y'all. But he won't do much through a prideful person. God can do a lot through a broken person. But he won't do much through a prideful person, a person that's living under their own strength. My way instead of God's way. You see, we have two options. We have, we have an option to live a self-centered existence where it's all about us or to live a God-centered existence where we are yielded fully to him. Whatever God wants, that's what we want. 
Whatever God wants for me, that's what I want. And we say that over and over. If we're not completely sure we believe it yet, that's what we want. Humbled and contrite before God. That's what God desires. And I want you all to know God's invitation is better than anything the world can give. God's invitation is greater than anything the world can represent. God's invitation, the love relationship that he has initiated with us, and the power of the Holy Spirit working through me, can do amazing things if I would just surrender. So God's invitation is twofold to us this morning. Firstly, of course, there's the general invitation offered to everyone to accept Jesus as Savior and Lord. And then there's the other, the more specific one, to allow God to work and move and use you in the place where he's put you now. So I have a couple of uh, what, what my friend C.J. Hart would say, next steps. Spend time with the Lord. Seems simple, doesn't it? Every sermon, every Bible study you could ever hear could come back to that one thing. Spend time with the Lord. How can you know God if you don't spend time with God? How can you, allow, can, how can you make him known to others? How can I make him known if I'm not spending time with God? Number two, ask God to open your eyes to what, he has, uh, what he's been doing around you. Then ask him for the faith to obey whatever he calls you to. Ask God to open your eyes to, the, to where he's working. Then ask him to give you the faith to step out and obey whatever he's calling you to. And then lastly, memorize John 14, 21. Memorize it. Let it, let it seep into your heart and your existence. This morning, I'm going to ask all who are, who are helping with, with, with Holy Communion. This, this is a, another invitation, a beautiful invitation that we're, all, that we're all to, that we're all called to. The table. The invitation to the table. And before God can work through you, he must work in you. And as we think of God's invitation to allow him to work through you, I want you to consider the invitation to the communion table as we prepare for this time. This is a holy moment, a time to remember what Jesus has done for every single one of us, all of us, and how inadequate we truly are in comparison. Let's go back to the the night of Jesus' arrest. Jesus was having a meal with his friends, and before that, he would agonize in the garden over his fate. He knew what was coming. One last meal with his friends, and he held up the bread, he took it and gave thanks to God, and then he broke it and gave it to his disciples, and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. And he said, do it in remembrance of me. Then he held up the cup, and after supper, took, took the cup of wine, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them. He said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, remember me. The invitation to the table is an invitation of surrender. It is an, initi- an invitation to repent of our sin and to, and, to, and to be renewed by God. Jesus invites everyone to his table so long as we are truly repentant of our sin. So as we get ready to respond to this invitation, take a moment where you are, and I'd like for you to examine your heart. I'd like for you to examine where you are in this grand divine work that God wants to do. Where you are. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads real quick. As we come to the table, the thought is, the hope is, is that we understand how big God is and how small we are in comparison. And when you come, we'd, like, we'd ask that you come with your hands cupped. We don't take what, what is given freely, what is offered freely. We receive it. Let someone place that bread in your hand. And then you're going to dip that bread in the cup. And watch that blood turn that, that that bread turn blood red. And you're going to consume it as a as a as an offering to remember the sacrifice, the blood poured out for all of us on the cross. 
Father, we love you. We're so thankful for what you're doing. We're thankful that we get to be a part of what you're doing. We're thankful that there's nothing in us that has earned one thing that you've done for us. We're thankful that in and of ourselves we are inadequate, but you are completely adequate and sufficient. Holy Spirit, we thank you for how you've worked and moved in us. I pray that you would get us to a point of surrender this morning. And as we worship God, I pray that what would be on our mind is the goodness and the grace of God. I pray all these things in your name. Amen. To spend a few moments in reflection, and then you come as you're directed in a few moments. Let's worship.